but we can go ahead and start on this pre-session. Um, mm -hmm. So let's uh, do a roll call. That's all we really need, and we use first names, and it's very mm -hmm. informal. So Shakita, you're supposed to start, and we'll go around. Shakita Narbro. Aaron Rodriguez. Marsha Martin. Susie Belga Faring. Joe Pip. Sean Boyd. Diane Crisp. And we do that because uh, people can listen in. So um, let's do a fast uh, update on our boards, commissions, whatever. Whoever wants to go first can go. I got something this week. Okay, John. Golf. Uh, they just elected new officers, and they have a bond. They talked about their bond project updates. Uh, so some of the things that they're doing are. Like they're having this really great sprinkler system put in at sunset where they can really see where the dry spots are and where it's over moist. Consortium Cities had a mental health uh, roundtable discussion and then uh, had the behavior uh, health roadmap uh, presented to us in the county. And then Parks and Rec uh, had a yearly accomplishment uh, PowerPoint where every aspect of the department went through everything and uh, they are having. You'll see in the new rec uh, program for the spring uh, some new fee increases and everything. And uh, they're just, uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about um, they're not able to meet their mark in regards to uh, sometimes an 80% coverage of their, their costs. And then we need to make, maybe at some point talk about what that looks like. How um, is, is there a sweet spot where that really is. Great, right, thanks. All our golf courses. Anyone else? Marsha. Yeah, um, this just a heads up that there's going to be a fairly substantial uh, request for money, the pump station and the Mindy Gap. Connectivity channel is at its end of life, and they mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. analyzed the um, existing pump station, and there's no good way to upgrade it, so they have to go to the new one. And mm -hmm. I'm, I have an email notes that I'm not succeeding in finding right now, okay. so I don't have the um, rough estimate that we were given, but it's it's substantial. Did you get one from Ken, Harold? I think they briefed me on it. I don't think I have an email on it. So they're not. They, it's it's too soon to have a firm estimate in there, but it's uh, something that somehow got. Uh, that doesn't sound good. No, it, yeah, it's, I mean, it's 40 years old, so this, this, the sad thing is everybody knows that's how long old-fashioned electrical power equipment works, and it should have been in somebody's budget for seven years or so, you yeah. know, so that we could be filling up the fund, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. but, so that's an ugly surprise. Um, other board stuff? Uh, not much because um, the uh, um, the senior advisory board, who is the most active board that I have, has decided to uh, educate themselves and do their own uh, research for their segment of the population on affordable housing and the and housing insecurity. Um, so they are probably going to be. They have they have set the goal of of producing some budget rec recommendations in the this month and next month, but they aren't there yet, so okay. they've done a lot of work though. Thanks. Not happy about them. Replacing the pump. No, <laughs> no. No, it's it's like they put the transformers so close together that you can't um, squeeze any bigger ones in. So Okay, who's next? Shakira? Yeah, I can go. Um, well, transportation, uh, we talked about the new, the coordinator, coordinator for the um, task force, um, Vision Zero was there. Um, 
we pretty much uh, just went over our the plan put together of what we'll be doing, the plan, the mobility plan and everything. Um, also, there was a lot of discussion about um, from board board members about the streets not being plowed and there's a misunderstanding with some of the the board members that want the bike lanes plowed during the snow and so we had that discussion um, so it was kind of hard and I was quiet for a long part a, a huge part of it until I just couldn't take it anymore and then I had to say that you know we have a shortage of staff and um, it's important for our streets to be plowed and um, and then what the complaint was th was that the 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 area where cars park you know mm -hmm. they said well why don't you some people were asking well why don't you make the cars move and things like that so one of the things we did talk about you know like in major cities that get a lot of snow like Chicago and New York and things like that they were talking about they have signs up that said during this period of time for them to plow that you, you know, a car can't be there kind of like when sweepers come and sweep this, the city you know the streets so we did discuss that I don't know how feasible that is but um, that may come back and I, I have no clue um, Longmont sister cities we um, we still don't know when Japan is, um, but there was a parent meeting with some of the other cities of Mexico and those who are going to Mexico and Northern Arapaho. Um, what else? I go to NADA on Thursday morning, so I haven't gone to that one. I go Thursday. What else am I missing? Oh, LDDA, we have our retreat on the 28th. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Woo Anyone else? Uh, sure. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the North I-25 Coalition, the Mustang and the um, Transportation Hub there at um, Ken Pratt or 119 and I-25, they think it will be done in four to seven months. It would be nice to have microtransit connect with that, but it seems like microtransit is going to go to about Sandstone Ranch where the city limit is. So we've got about three miles between there and the hub mm -hmm. that an industrious person needs to start a business to <laughs> pick up the drama. Or we need to find a way to have microtransit go out that far. Um, so there's some uh, enthusiasm for it because a lot of people ride down to Denver or up to Fort Collins and that's uh, will be a, a south going platform on the west side of the highway and a north platform on the east side of the highway and they've expanded that um, park and ride there too and I believe the tunnel that goes underneath is completely now. So, so um, there's access for bicycles and pedestrians to get across the highway safely underneath. Let's see. I don't know what you're going to say. What's that? I don't know what you're going to say. What's that? About my Oh, yeah. I'll answer <laughs> one of the questions in a little bit. We try to get to the last mile. Now we have three more miles. So we'll figure it out, I'm sure. Um, so then there's uh, Longmont Economic Development our retreat at the end of January. There's a lot of discussion. Harold was there too. I don't even know how to encompass everything we talked about. Um, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, to, be, to be continued, there's a lot of conversation about um, five different areas. We heard a lot of that in our retreat. And so how that develops, we posted. Um, we just did the, the GERP today in terms of the retirement pension fund. And um, we negotiated the mix a little bit. I think we did some good work there. We decided that we're going to meet our, our uh, target point for next year for retire retirees. And then um, there's a ribbon cutting over here that um, Passport is what, the, um, what used to be the Dickens. And 
going to see the Dickens Opera House up there too, which they're going to have opera here in Yay. March. Isn't that nice? The yes. Blue Room Operatic Society is going to be 2nd and 3rd, right over here on 3rd in May. So that's pretty exciting. I feel like I'm missing one. What else do I do? Oh, visit Longmont. And that'll be Monday. So I, I'm always just, it's a whole month. <laughs> trying to go back and think about the museum that, that was the one where we talked so I have museum advisor the next one right on Wednesday next week, yeah. so I had to <laughs> so think about like what the last Wednesday, the last yeah. Wednesday. Um, so you know and I guess I want to sh give a shout out to Don I think she was the one who coordinated all this the training for the um, members the um, board members on um, board orientation well, yes Yes. Ordering. Yes. So I heard a lot of outstanding oh, feedback from the members of the museum and library advisory board members who attended. Good. So they good they job. just had nothing but great reviews. So awesome. Yay. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. So um, yeah. So that was good. At at the museum uh, advisory board, one of the um, the things that we discussed was you know we're kind of keeping track of um, how much money they've acquired for their um, $8.1 million goal for the expansion, and uh, we're at 85% of the way. That's impressive. Yes, yes. Are going to release their donors list? Um, I don't know, I'll ask, but I'm sure you can like that. that. Oh, yeah. So I absolutely, but, uh, buy, it, but also, or I know, and something, bigger, something than bigger than that, or you, yeah, no, I mean, like when we donated to, um, we were lived in San Diego, Petco Park. Oh, when yeah. They rebuilt the when they built the stadium. We just got a we're able to put it get a placard, oh. so our little name is on there because we donated. <laughs> so so things like that. There's there's opportunities to to have recognition for that. So that that was great news. Um, in our and you know they're they're doing what they do and just getting those programs out and and reaching out, especially with um, youth engagement. So it sounds like their, their mission, they were updating their vision statement. So really putting a focus on um, youth engagement and getting more um, act, active uh, participants in that realm. Um, and then for the library, um, you know, we were looking at, it seems like for this group, they really just wanna know more how they can be an active group and so really working with the friends of the library finding ways to gain funds to support they again they were asking me you know what's our commitment to the library as far as sustainable programs and um, staffing because that's that's been an area of concern especially since the ballot measures didn't pass um, one of the I'm gonna find where I kind of um, I was looking at the organizational chart. So one of the things we were looking at was just the staffing overall. So all of the library staff can fit nicely into one page. So even down to the temp staff. So it's not really, when we think about the large scale things of what they do as, um, in the community, it's not a lot of people doing a lot of work. And so how, you know, and I think this is where they're kind of pondering how they're going to re rethink some things as far as around adult programming. It seemed like the emphasis was really keeping those uh, children programming. Mm -hmm. You know, another option would be to charge for adult um, classes, mm -hmm. um, whereas before they didn't, a lot of members on the board did not like that because they felt like we're, we're a public entity, we should be providing these services for free. So there's still ongoing debate on how they can cut corners but still provide quality um, programming I, and as well as things that we can't necessarily see like those digital, mm -hmm. you know, the, all those people are accessing um, books and online materials through the digital format, but that also costs money. And so while we might not be able to see it like a brick and mortar building or the books, um, these are things that are costing, that are, you know, weighing on the on the library.
library budget. And so what, what do we as a council prioritize and you know, are we gonna put our money where our mouth is? Kind of, and I heard the whole thing. So, <laughs> so I wanna let them know that I was gonna convey um, that you know, it's, it's, they're, they're working to try to find ways to, to cut things, but. Um, be more concise and be more concise but there are things that are non-negotiable and that would be the, the really the children's program and um, the stuff that Lillian does out in the community and she does have a she does do a lot of support with the schools and you know she's a one man one woman <laughs> operation and um, she does great work so you know we really hate you know, burnout I think was another top area of concern that we were having that people are getting expanded too much as well as our people at the desk circulation so they're dealing with a lot of angry um, people coming to the you know demanding things or being upset because for whatever reason um, they've received some things about wanting books removed for being inappropriate so, <laughs> so essentially the banning of the books yeah, kind of thing so we had that kind of conversation and yeah. so really the ones that are having to deal with it are, you know, the people at the information desk, the circulation desk, temp, temp workers, you know, the, our lower paid wage earners are and having to do volunteer for that job. For to what to um to, to be the person who says we don't bend books at the Oh yeah, exactly. And um, no, but John has been really good about it's like, okay, well thank you for your concern. I'm not gonna pull that book and that's it and so he's been really see good. You later. See you later. <laughs> Don't check it out. <laughs> so I mean, what else? Um, what and, other? And then RCAB on? was the other one I was trying to remember because we have an upcoming RCAB. Um, one of the big, so we separate out into subcommittees. So the subcommittee I am working on is soil. Oh. So um, <laughs> in that discussion the people that I was with had been talking about, and then when we came back as a bigger group, this also became a topic, a uh, big concern or talk, is um, that we don't have a local or regional composting facility. Uh -huh. And so really wanting to find, work with Boulder County, finding a way to make, you know, I was very quiet, I have my own ideas and things, but I just was listening at that point. So I didn't really, um, you know, I, I agree, but I, I should have mentioned that there is a resolution on the sustainability advisory board mm -hmm. on that subject. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, I think it's yeah, exactly. So I have kind of cut into that. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's it. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so, the Housing Human Services Board. Uh, Early years, just normal stuff, electing officers, approving bylaws, approving meeting, or post, posting where the meetings are, that kind of stuff. As well as, uh, as they've done over the past few years, we know, improved their grant application process. So they're still continuing to explore more ways to improve that process before they really get into the meat of the season. Um, all the same thing with planning and zoning, all they went through was election chair and all that. And, uh, and then they were informed that because Master Board of Appeals cannot make quorum, that they'll be taking on some of that workload. Um, and so they'll be hearing their first variance as sort of the Master Board of Appeals uh, on the 28th. Um, tomorrow night, they, their meeting will just be a couple of presentations. One, I believe, on Vision Zero, and I think the other one might be uh, the housing assessment that we already have heard. Um, the NGLA just had Harold in for the state of the city. So, there you go. Nice. Okay, I think everybody good. Yep. Except me. So, um, I'm pretty excited that we just got. Uh, news release, something that had been working on for basically 10 years. And um, so CDOT, CDOT, Front Range Passenger Rail, and RTD, uh, per the group that Governor Polis put together, 
are, have been told, basically, that they're going to form a JPA, a Joint Partnership Authority, just like every other authority in other uh, states, like the Port Authority in New York, the Transit Authority in Chicago, etc. And uh, with that, part of the FISA money, the Fast Track's internal savings account for the Northwest Corridor, is going to go to putting uh, in whatever we need to get that corridor started. And then it's going to transfer to Front Range Passenger Rail. So it'll no longer be RTD. And the reason for that is uh, Front Range Passenger Rail is, is passenger rail. Um, RTD is commuter rail. There is no dollars. Commuter rail would be in, uh, in FTA. Um, and passenger rail is FRA. So that way they get uh, federal funding through the same funding that the FR, that the Front Range Passenger Rail District is getting to finish that. And it'll be the first leg from Denver to Longmont to Fort Collins will be the first leg of Front Range Passenger Rail. So with any luck, we would get out of the tax for Fort for uh, passenger I'm so excited about this. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you. We've been working on it for so dang long. Um, so the tax for RTD Northwest Corridor would go away and we would get the train. So for us it's a win-win. However, there will be, and Governor Polis is pushing for a tax on Front Range Passenger Rail on the November ballot um, and I really am in favor of this because instead of putting another 20 years on for the Northwest Corridor, mm -hmm. I think they can finish that very first segment from Union Station to Fort Collins within a seven year time period. So um, that would be the first, that's the first leg and there's, I just sent all of you the news release mm -hmm. so you can read. and. Uh, so without reading the news release, is there any chance that what you said about getting out from under the RTD district tax, that that would be announced before the Oh, of course, because that's what yeah. I've been saying that's that all of the meetings is that um, we are not, I said I'm not going to have the, the residents of Boulder County paying two rail taxes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when one of them's never going to happen. And the other one is a real rail um, authority. It's really rail, whereas RTD is not. It's not really a done deal. Uh, what I'm hearing on the FRPR board, we've just had an executive session on it this morning, is that um, it's just flipped. The North, with RTD, has been <coughs> yelling that we're paying a lot of money and we haven't gotten anything. And now the South, um, the FRPR board is saying, oh yeah, all this is going into the north, what about the south? So it kind of made me smile at the meeting. But uh, the difference is that both RTD and FRPR are statutory, created by the legislature. So the governor and the legislature can mandate. Um, so I'm excited that we're going to make some headway and I, I think it's a good, it's a good plan. So the other thing is that El Mac Chinese New Year is Monday. So uh, Tim Waters is going to be the MC, and I'm going to give the opening remark and then read the proclamation. So um, the Historic Preservation Commission, by the way, they're very happy about our vote. Um, they are going to have their retreat next week, so we'll go to that. Um, so far, that's all I've got. And one of the things in that plan, I just want to, they may use the RTD tax as the contribution, which right. wouldn't mm -hmm. put in the FRPR tax. You know, they're, they're going to flip it? They, they, you know, they're going to they pull that money and yeah. just transfer it over, yeah. which it's one of the options. Well, yeah, and this isn't a done deal. This is their concept, and um, Harold and I met with. Um, Lisa Kaufman and John Putnam. And uh, basically, they said that Longmont is pivotal, pivotal in the Front Range Passenger Rail District, mm -hmm. that we have to do the Northwest Corridor. So, 
Thank you. And this is the one I was alluding to on those transportation projects and core services, that if this happens and they compress within seven years, we've got to get first main transit moving so that it's ready. Exactly. At the same time, so that's going to press us into work and how we start scheduling. And uh, a train stop, because the trains are much bigger than a bus, uh, taller, so they probably won't be able to go into the transit station. And we, we did walk that corridor, and there, were, there was a lot of really good conversations. That little red train station, they talked about moving that over um, and making that the train stop, which would be kind of cool because it's historical. And it's, Kind of cute. The liquor store or the other one? No. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we really get a lot of writers at the liquor store. It's know the other one on first. Yeah, the okay, original okay. train. Yeah, okay. Train yeah. Stuff. yeah. Okay. So that that is uh, that's very exciting for me. And that's all I got. I so got one thing that um, I think we just completed a video that I have with the kids at um, the Youth and Family Services for the um, life Skills Fair, March 30th. Mm -hmm. So be looking out for oh, that little good. video. I haven't Next seen day. it yet, but they, I think I got the email about it, so I haven't clicked on it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, Susie, you talk to your students and mm -hmm. let so them. We've been, so I've been letting parents know during parent-teacher talk. Okay, awesome. So, yeah, okay. So I'm super excited. And Target may come in and give us some money for it too. So interested, yeah. Cool. The other thing, micro transit. Sure. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so Harold and I have been talking about, and this came up actually because of uh, Will Carspeck, who is the mayor of uh, Berthoud, um, and he wants a, a, a rail stop for the Grand Range passenger rail. So we met. And of course, he's not going to get one right away. But we're doing the micro transit here. And uh, doesn't Fort Collins have micro transit? I don't know that they do yet. But uh, but everybody's looking at it as well as Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So what actually Harold's idea was that we need to talk to Firestone, uh, Frederick, Bertha for cons and see if all of the cities couldn't get micro transit. Mm -hmm. And then they could go border to border to your point. Mm -hmm. That there's that three mile that we could make connections that way so that everybody has availability to go to the bus terminals, to the rail terminals. Mm -hmm. um, that that's an option. Because I do feel bad for Frederick and Firestone. RTD just goes Right up and won't cross over. They're not. They're not in the district. They're not in the district yet. So. Um, Although they're now they have the parking right on their side, and they also have better trails. And uh, one thing about the passenger underneath the highway is it connects, as like, yes. the transportation board that was concerned about transportation, transportation on bicycle, but, you know how to get across that highway. So now that's correct. It's great. But bus thing um, also is. Yeah. is one of the stops there as well as oh, gosh, yeah. And this is through CDOT, not RTD. So. Yeah. Is there any idea how much the um, tax rate will be for the for range passenger way? Or no, we haven't. Have decided yet? No, and also we're discussing uh, of making only the section that is being developed pay the taxes. And then we'll add the sections to, they don't stop paying the tax once it's built. But if you're not going to have it for 15 years, then you don't have to pay the tax, hmm. which will. Do we get credit for our 20 years of paying in there? <laughs> well, in a sense, we do. Okay. Because part of the FISA account mm -hmm. is going to go to doing the, I would say, I don't know exactly what they need. BNSF is giving their analysis for that route hopefully in March, beginning of April. So whatever it is that BNSF says they need to do on that line, I think that's what that dollars of FISA that we have paid, just Boulder County, 
because there are three other unfinished corridors that have been paid in the FISA too. There's about $180 million in there. We can't take all of it because of those other three corridors. And that, money, that portion of our money will go to doing the upgrades that BNSF says we need to do. We won't get it back, but it will be invested for what it was supposed to be invested in all along. So, does it, that Read makes the sense. white paper that's yeah. linked on attached. Yeah, it's pretty involved. We're very excited. The thing's oh. supposed to be ready to go in June or September, depending on how the, you know, the roadway work continues. Yeah. We should have a lot of transportation options. So. Well, we're moving along, so it's good. So let's morph into the ethics. Did they, everybody or anybody read this? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to make a correction before we get your input because um, the last, this will be the last discussion on this and then it'll go to council for a motion. No, no, no. As soon as this, if, if we make corrections, then we have to correct it and then come back. The one thing I want to correct before we go in is that the meaning of what it's on the last page and and this draft actually this last draft was put together with a conversation with uh, legal Eugene May and Harold and we discussed the former draft and pulled this all together so um, under complaints, it says, upon receipt of the hearing officer's written interpretation and or recommendation regarding a complaint, the city clerk shall pre provide written notice to the complainant. That's not really true. Um, the city, it will go to the city clerk's office, but the city clerk's office won't read any of the complaints. It's, she's just going to be a pass-through. Um, and then the pass-through will go to the hearing officer's mailbox. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I think it's important that it goes as a pass-through is that we need somebody to track these complaints that they come in like If we haven't heard anything back, she, they can put it on their calendar, check in two weeks, mm -hmm. check in a month, see, see if there's any traction on it at all. So um, the other thing is that the drop-down box for complaints. I had talked to Marika, I think I told you this before she left, and Ian, and they helped put this together. That will be on the new web page. Um, the the drop-down box for what complaints can be made. Um, did you read it or shall I let me read it again? It's a uh, disclosure of confidential information, a conflict of interest, improper influence or treatment, quasi-judicial proceedings, advisory opinion, and other violations of state law or the charter or code pertaining to an ethical conduct. So did anyone want anything different? Do you think that um, there, those are adequate? Should we add more? I think they're adequate, but I am looking under complaints and advisory opinions. Is that where the wording changes? Because I didn't quite catch that. Um, no, the, that's the, that is the second to the last one. Other violation of state law or the charter or code. Did you get that? I'm unclear where we are. Maybe. It is under what, what page and section? Mm -hmm. I'm online, so it's four. Page four. It's what's the second one? That one right there. Page right. five. It's yeah. this. This okay. would be the drop down box. Okay. That's so it's just that's the type of purpose. Right. Oh, that's my page four. Oh. oh. It's in the meeting viewer. It's on page four. Four. Okay. 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 Page four. Page four. Four. Page four. So. Um, the reason that these are here, and Tim Waters brought this up actually, of uh, what kind of complaints, what do we call them? 
I just lost it. Frivolous, thank you. Oh, no. That it would uh, keep out frivolous complaints. Yes, yeah. That don't amount to oh, I didn't like the way you talked to me, so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that leaves that out. Okay. Um, and it says who's complaining. And we can see it. It's quasi judicial. Do you want to explain what that is? So, uh, what was that for me? Yeah. You're the best at it. You're the best. <laughs> so, it's somewhere here in the definition. About the sound of the definition. It's a uh, in the conduct section. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, page three in the viewer. It's. C4 under rules of conduct, it's the last one. And Planning Zoning Commission and the City Council will serve as quasi judicial uh, decision makers on certain matters, traditionally land use. And this is where you're applying pre existing criteria to a single property, and uh, property owners' uh, property rights are at stake. And so there are due process protections for those quasi-judicial proceedings, so which are a fair and impartial hearing. And this rule of conduct basically says if, say, counsel is the decision maker in a quasi-judicial proceeding, you will not uh, represent or participate in the proceeding from the other side of the dais because that would be improper for you to be a decision maker and also participating either on behalf of the applicant or in opposition to the applicant. So how does that work with if you're on the board? For instance, board of um, planning and zoning or in a liaison for it or with the historic preservation commission, for instance, that goes into a management at this time that have those to see that have those types of property rights involved. So you know about members. the situation before it comes before council, so you may have already developed an opinion or participated in some decisions that were made for or against what the owners for decision making about the property. Uh, so there are rules uh, to protect due process. Uh, the one you'll often hear from me is no ex parte communications. You shouldn't be speaking to anybody outside the hearing process. The whole idea is that you make the decision based on evidence presented at the hearing. Um, if you have some other contact or affiliation with the property, uh, my general advice is it needs to be, say for the man, Coops, who owns the pump house. You know, he decided a lot of things on Main Street and in terms of the conflict, uh, it's whether there's any special treatment or burden on that property different from all those other businesses in the industry, right? Because we have citizen boards and we have citizens elected to city council. Um, that's the beauty of it. You're, you're in the community and you can't, it, it'd be unreasonable to say no interest whatsoever. That's why the standard is, you know, a special burden or special treatment particular to your property different from those adjoining property owners. that makes sense? Mm -hmm. So somewhat um, specific to the situation. Yes. Yeah. But if you were on planning and zoning, you're not a voting member, so you might just be there to hear it. So it's not like it's a public meeting. you're not, uh, you might at that hearing start to, in your head to formulate an a, a opinion about that. but. You, as long as you're not saying to members of the public or anything what you've already formulated, is that? Um, you know, council members and board members are allowed to educate themselves on the matter before them. Uh, certainly have staff reports. Uh, you know, that's why I generally discourage site visits because then you have information that the other council members or PZ members don't have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's some sort of remedial processes, you know, you can recuse, mm -hmm. uh, you can disclose uh, whatever contact you've had uh, and make a decision on your own whether you can remain a fair and impartial decision maker. 
or under the rules of procedure, you can ask the body to uh, vote whether they think you can remain a fair and impartial decision maker. Does that answer the questions? Well, I was thinking that if you, you know, just because you're on that board and you attend the meeting, and, but you're not a voting member and you just paid attention while you were there, uh, it doesn't mean that you, even if you start to establish at that point, you know, your own opinions on those things, as long as you're not talking to members of the public about about your opinion on that before we have a hearing with city council, you're you're safe. If you start having having conversations at, after that planning zoning commission meeting, let's say using that one for example, because we're talking oftentimes about property uh, issues, then that would probably deem that you needed to have a conversation. Uh, about uh, you know accusing yourself, but otherwise it's not a. It shouldn't be a big deal. I mean, everybody's going to have an opinion. You can have your own opinion yeah, if you keep it to yourself. Yeah. Um, there are ex parte communication rules uh, mm -hmm. under the due process protection. So if you attended the hearing, um, you should not be communicating with the city council who's the decision maker mm -hmm. under the ex parte rules to preserve due process protections for all parties involved. So there is the question that residents will, or the objection that residents will often make, which is, I know that council member does not agree with our position because of their campaign statements they make during the campaign. That's not an ex parte commission, nor is it a, a reason why they should recuse, correct? That. Uh, that's not an ex parte communication, it could be a prejudgment, which is sort of a different sort of category of the due process protections if you, um, in an extreme case, already have expressed, you know, I'm going to vote this thing down no matter what happens, then maybe you might not be able to remain a fair and impartial decision maker based on the evidence presented at the hearing. And in that circumstance, you may have to recuse yourself, it just, it's very fact dependent. So that would be, though, there would be a distinction between uh, campaigning regarding a specific parcel of land or, or case as opposed to um, the general idea of how the planning area should be treated. Yes, I'd say so. I mean, each one is going to be a fact specific. Well, and it's different between a legislative act and a quasi-judicial sure. act. So a legislative act like and land use is annexation. The zoning and the variances, that's quasi-judicial. And they're distinctly different. Okay, so my... If I can, to some of the questions, Eugene, a lot of times when we start seeing things that we think are going to be an issue, Eugene will send emails to you all right. and mm -hmm. say, Highly likely this is going to be quasi-judicial. We recommend that you don't engage in conversations. And sometimes we'll do that really early in the process. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So um, do you want anything changed on how the complaint will go to a website? Um, the complaint is made. It goes to the city clerk's office. She will route it on to and this is my other question. We had discussed in previous pre-sessions about who is going to pay attention or who is going to be the third party to hear the complaint. Should it be a hearing board? Should it be a task force or a hearing officer? There didn't seem to be any discussion, so I put hearing officer in here because of my conversations with Harold. And um, before we have comments, because Harold might have to leave, um, tell us why you think the hearing officer is a good idea. Um, there's a few things. One, and first and foremost, I think about our involvement in this, the biggest issue for us is we did not want staff involved in, in, in any way. And, and so with the hearing officer, they tend to have their own staff that can support them. And so we can go in and, and deal with the 
um, um, they can go in and just manage it so we don't have to touch it. If you have a board, then that's going to require staff involvement in that process because they're going to need somebody to support it. Um, the other thing we talked about is the hearing officer, we use them all the time um, for personnel decisions and things like that. They're always separate and apart from it, and, and they're really, there's no way to make a political argument that this person is influenced because if it's an appointed board, we think that opens up the door to a lot of assertions of, well, this board was appointed by this group of council and they right. made this decision. And so we really think it keeps us out of the mix mm -hmm. and the staff, and um, it does really keep it beyond arm's length in terms of a, a neutral party that reviews these things. Where does the hearing officer come from? An individual, or it's an individual with staff. It's third party. There's groups that there are professional hearing officers okay. that you can contract with to they come in and hear the cases or hear whatever it is. We'd have to do an RFP to obviously get that done. But. And under the draft proposal, it's envisioned to be a special counsel, an attorney, and a law firm. And uh, you know, a lot, a lot of these ideas came from Fort Collins, and I know they did an RFP, and there's uh, firms and attorneys that specialize in ethics. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I get my CID from mm -hmm. attending their uh, seminars, and even though it wouldn't be, you know, they're focused on attorney regulation, but they understand ethics more broadly. Mm -hmm. And that's who I'd hope would respond to so would we retain them, or would it be case by case? Because I don't expect there's going to be a lot of complaints. Uh, if it is special counsel under the charter, uh, we would retain them. Counsel would approve that contract, and then we just have them on a yeah. soon hourly basis or whenever that's needed. Okay. So it's no longer a cost. Oh, good. That's what I was afraid of. So, um, so I need, I need. I have to know. a few questions. Uh, yeah, it all came back to me now as I was thinking about it after reading it. A few questions. One, I think it stated that um, whatever the hearing officer come up with, it will be presented during council meeting. Um, I think that like they for us to make that decision exactly. Yeah, it might, it'll probably be a uh, an email to that, and we didn't we can go over that actually. So, as proposed, the hearing officer would make a recommendation, a written mm -hmm. interpretation and recommendation uh, for these matters, uh, certainly for council members and for uh, charter boards and commissions. The city council would be the decision whether to adopt or modify the <laughs> recommendation of the hearing officer. And that will be via email or would that be at a city council it would meeting? Be at a city council That's meeting. what I was wondering. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I'm not sure if I feel, I mean, should it be public like that in the city council meeting? I know we have to vote on but. Does it do its damage already? If it's going to do damage, it's going to do damage there uh, to somebody. And then if there's no yeah. proof until uh, we've had a hearing officer, then you, I think what you're trying to say is all of a sudden you get, you uh, have damage done to your reputation before you even have any chance to prove otherwise. Or I think we get the information in the email, mm -hmm. and then we go to city council, and then we all decide on what should happen according to the last part of that of the code of ethics, right, page, um, but then there won't be, I think it will, I think we really need to think about this because then there won't be, pub, if we're going to do this in the public, then there won't be public hearing either. Um, I mean, people invited, public invited to be heard won't be able to say anything. I don't know, it's just kind of tricky for me as I'm thinking it, as I was reading it. But do, does the public need to have input? If that's public, what I, if no, public, I don't think they do, but we're putting it out there, and I can only imagine all the emails we're going to get about it. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I was just thinking about it, and I just wanted to hear what everybody else thought about that. The hearing officer can get as much input as they need. They can call witnesses or whatever they need to do. 
So there's no point in having public invited to be heard way in on it because it's not a public process. It is a council process. It is a council process, and I'm not asking for public invited to be heard oh, to speak you. on it, but what I was asking was, if we get all the, if I know we have to vote on it, um, can we not vote on it on in a pre-session, or does it have to be public? That's what I'm asking, because, it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's gonna be out in the public, and I don't, I don't know. I've never been in a situation like this, so I was just thinking about how that would play out with the public. Um, I don't think we can take official notes unless we're in the session. Right, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. It has to be in yeah. session. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, if I may, yes, the, please. The uh, hearing officer does have screening criteria. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as proposed, if it's frivolous or groundless, it doesn't go any further. The hearing mm -hmm. officer screens it out. If it's unlikely to be proven uh, by preponderance of the evidence, the person has, <coughs> who's the subject of the complaint has admitted wrongdoing and is committed to sufficient redress, these are all sort of off-ramps to the written recommendation to city council. Or the matter will, has become or will become moot because the person who's the subject of the complaint is no longer a city official or will no longer be a city official mm -hmm. prior to the conclusion of the investigation. It's only if they advise, if, if, if the advisory uh, the from the hearing officer, the advice from the hearing officer is that they come to the conclusion that yes, there was improper behavior here or whatever, then city council needs to discuss it at a council meeting and make a motion to either follow the hearing officer's advice or not. But also, um, the uh, co the person that has been complained, what is that, the complainant? Mm -hmm. or the subject. subject of the complaint, thank you, um, gets to have a voice in a council. I'll just make sure I violate all the ethics in November of next year. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, all right. I'm, I'm out of here. Eight years. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Are you done this? Go on. Go on the blades. Okay. Um, so, does the hearing officer say, yes, this complaint is, uh, rises to the level of here is the complaint council we need? Uh, a hearing on this, or does the hearing officer actually make a recommendation to guilty or not? I think it says it rises to the complaint. The hearing officer will not tell us we need a hearing right. on it. That's their job. They have the hearing. And then they advise the results of that hearing. Yes, we think it rises to the level Recommend of censure recommend or recommend. Who's the yeah. hearing officer first then if then to counsel. Right. And so what with an advice. And if I was the hearing officer, I would make that recommendation. I would not recommend a penalty. No. I would, no. I would leave that up to counsel. Right. right. Mm -hmm. we have to and and we don't have, there are not a lot of penalties mm -hmm. at all, which, which was in the, censure is the, the most used one, I would say, the most viable one. Um, but if it is something egregious that is a continuing thing, then you can say things like you may not come to any more executive sessions, or you, you can't be on boards or commissions, um, whatever. Can I ask one question in Eugene? Were you thinking these fall under normal CORA rules? Do you think it, if we're going to be specific here, it makes me wonder if we should quantify on the web page form, which clearly isn't built yet, that may be subject to open record, if we would get a request. May, I mean, under normal CORA. Yeah, because it will, it'll be an email, so it will be a CORA. Yeah, just the clarity for exactly. the council and for the public. I didn't think I should have thought of that. Thank you. Yeah. So all the all the frivolous complaints can be cored as well, or only the ones 
that the hearing officer says rise in the level of their being examination? Everything like that goes know. into this drop down mm -hmm. box on the web, the complaint that is made on the web, because it's all email. But that is the point of the type of request is that you try to leave out everything that would be frivolous. Well, that's not going to impact residents. No, people can do this left and right. You look to be funny. But yeah, that, but that's not, not, a, not on the But that's not there. on there. <laughs> it has to be, um, you choose one of these that it falls under. <laughs> is harassment like a form of harassment on there? No. No. And that is why I put a link to the uh, to the ethical behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that, if if we that would go into rules of procedure, I think. What? I don't think there would be an ordinance. It would just be this is what we expect of uh, elected a, officials. What's advisory opinion? Advisory opinions are usually based on hypotheticals you know in this circumstance would this be a conflict of interest i think are the probably but i mean that's the drop down menu so what would somebody I think request so is that they're requesting their advisory opinion from the from what they want to complain about it and then, if, then, the, then the hearing officers would say this is frivolous yeah. It does not rise to the location. But there's also improper, improper uh, influence or treatment. And if somebody, to the point of, you know, looking to be funny, they might say that improper yes. treatment fell under that. No, I think that would be more of a... Uh, would likely still be found frivolous. So. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah but... Farther than but that. And that would never go to the public. But well, the core, yeah, it would. It could. Yeah, you just answered Joan the other way, with it, where the, it would, that the, the complaint, once it goes in, that it's horrible, as opposed to once it's But they would filter. also get the, uh, they would also get the advice from the hearing officer. Do you want me to take out advisory opinion? That's, if this is, sounds like it's going to be Well, no, I, I'm just, I'm not sure. Just, Ahead, no, I just think it's just the thing that it, it seems like only things that were founded should be allowed to be court. Because otherwise it looks like, some, uh, you know, if somebody wanted to make it their life's mission, and we have sometimes over the years members of the public that have made it their life's mission to, to be kind of... Uh, there we go. Have your good follow up and suppression of information either. Yeah, because yeah. no, yeah. I think we have so to make the state law. So it's horrible is, I think, a real slippery slope. That no, I well, if they said, you know, going to social media, um, the advisory opinion is that this is under free speech and does not rise to the level. And, and, and we would keep staff out of that. We wouldn't argue about it on council. Um, and once that once that message went out from a hearing officer for me it would i don't know i have a question so Please. and this might be you know eugene can help clarify this as well so i'm looking at type of request so the is it type of request that we're wanting from the city or is it the type of complaint because it's um you know conflict of interest that's a complaint Improper influence or treatment, that's a complaint. Uh, Quasi-judicial quasi proceedings, that's, that would be a complaint in relation to that. Um, advisory opinion, so that, are you requesting what the hearing officer had advised on or what, I guess, I'm looking at the other items and those kind of all lead to that the, that one of a council member had made a violation on that. So, did they make a violation on an advisory opinion? No, is that it's a request. For it's a request advice. for information. But I do okay. see what Susie is saying because, because all of these are you're listing out all the um, complaints or the um, the violations. 
except for that one. Well, and request. now that you said it, when I look at improper influence or treatment, from a resident's point of view, if they feel they were treated improperly, mm -hmm. or if they feel that um, I could see improper influence, it needs to be stated differently, mm -hmm. improper influence on a... Uh, I guess what's the just improper influence? Improper I mean, these the drop-down requests were meant to track the rules of conduct within this code of ethics. Right. And there is a section on improper treatment or anything, so mm -hmm. I have to fall under this mm -hmm. rule of conduct. So I'm not sure what improper treatment is, but I do know that I get accused of uh, having conflicts of interest on a monthly or even sometimes weekly basis just based on my in, the in, intellectual property record in my previous career. Um, and so uh, the, despite the fact that, as you know, Eugene, I've made full disclosure and you know, we've explained that multiple times, it keeps coming up just because it's a convenient way for people to you know, drag red herrings across council procedures. And, uh, and that's what this is, is uh, addressing. Can we readdress it if there's uh, a, a, a something that we didn't see that seems to be a uh, kind of uh, probably an isolated situation of, of somebody abusing this form just to, to kind of uh, uh, rail against council's policies or practices? Uh, is it something that we readdress if there if it became? No, no. Um, I think we need to look at this different way. The way it is laid out, mm -hmm. it goes to the hearing officer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come to us to make a decision about whether this uh, free speech or it, that decision from the hearing officer is this does not rise to the level of a complaint. They're the ones that need to address the complaint. So not city council, not staff. And so will it stop them? No. Well, the question the question is the stuff off this form, when it reaches the hearing officer, is that part of the public record or does it become a part of the public record only when the hearing officer delivers a recommendation. I think that if, uh, if, the, if the advisory comment is that this does not rise to the level of a complaint, uh -huh. then it's dead. We don't even discuss it. Well, in that case, those, those, are, the, those yeah. are the recommendations yeah. that everybody, the yeah. reservations yeah. that we've all been expressed. You know, it's a moot point at that point. It's like, yeah, but so. you still have the expense of the hearing officer. That's true. We don't know what people are going to put on here, and I think that. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I actually support it. I just am like trying to think of all the possible abuses of it as well. Uh, oh yeah, we could go on forever yeah, on that. Not, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that anyone is going to totally, constantly, constantly complain about something when they are said this is not. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> why, that, that, that laugh but right there is why. why. <laughs> but you know why, Shakita? Because mm -hmm. they no come process. to council and our comment is, we have a place on our website for you to lodge a complaint. We are not going to discuss it up here now. Period, end of center. Yeah, as long as we communicate that, give enough notice of that's the new process of right. complaints, that's very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very it important. is. And, um, and, and staff then, has a way to say, might be valid, go out to the website and, and launch a complaint. But I do think we need to be very specific um, and explicit as to what, we're, what information that we are asking on those drop downs. So to make sure who is it addressing and who they're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Be very specific because I think um, people can 
a lot of times I know it's, it's them. People don't read everything. Mm -hmm. They just know this is a place to complain. Mm -hmm. And they're just going to be any, many, money mo or click. You know what I'm saying? So let's be very careful with how we word that so they know who they're addressing it to, why they're addressing it, and what's the process. Okay. So I think that's very important. And we are going over time oh. for the LHA meeting. So, okay. um, so, okay, so Susie, can, what well, you know what, really fast. quick, really quick, I just, so when people are putting this, you know, they're writing up their complaint, perhaps we can say, you know, your complaint won't go won't go through if you have not tied the complaint to which rules of procedure or which code of ethics did they violate. And that so could it has be, to be a violation that is what we have codified in language already. That's, that's a good idea. In with their complaint and what they experience. Mm -hmm. So having those two tied together, if they're not tied together, that complaint is it, it won't be processed. And that should be on the website above the complaint. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe okay. with an explanation or vocabulary, sometimes those terms are good. Yeah. Okay. And you can build a form where if you don't select that, this, then yeah, or where you only have the choices and you that can't go on. Or we can see. I, I think that makes that will be better. Yeah. 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 And the, and actually, thanks. I remember now when we were looking at how to build the website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is what they said they can't really do any more than this until they know if it's going to be a hearing officer. Or what? Okay. And, and we have just barely touched the surface. I mean, other than saying we want a hearing officer, we don't want staff involved. Right. Mm -hmm. So we haven't been able to engage in this until we get council direction as right. a body to say yes or no in terms of time spent. On it. Okay. So do we want a hearing officer versus a hearing board? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Do we? Are we okay with the drop down? box way of being able to lodge a complaint with, I'm going to call it a preamble above it, explaining and maybe definitions of each complaint. Yes. What does this mean? Mm -hmm. yes. So that they, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there anything else about the 10 day, the hearing officer gives 10 days to the person that is, the, the complaint is lodged against to respond? And the reason why I'm saying 10 days is the person could be on vacation. It could be during the Christmas holiday. It could be... Um, is that reasonable? Is that a reasonable time frame? Can they request a, an extension if they were, like, on vacation out of town? That seems like yeah. 30 um, days. You know, that's I'll between... 10 days is really short. Yeah, yeah 30 that's days. what I was wondering, if it's a reasonable amount of time. Okay, that's what I want to know. I, think, I was thinking 30 days. 30 days? I'm also wondering if there could be some. To the end of my term. I don't want to say this. <laughs> if it's already considered frivolous from the hearing officer, if it could just be expunged. If it could be what? Expunged, you know, like removed. I know we're talking about there should be open records, but it could say, you know. The it could be confidential. Found because confidential. Uh, or just, or just, or just, or just say that you found, you know, so many. The outcome would be on there as well. Or something. Because if you get your drop down menu and you don't have something that relates to your actual complaint, where does that go? Well, does it just disappear? Well, I think they just need us to, you all just need us to say, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And I'll yeah. say this and that, and then we'll come back with other stuff. So Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. yes, we need the groundwork. The yeah. thing where I get anxious is, well, we may want to go this, this, and this. State law regulates what is an open record and what is not an open record, mm -hmm. and so we the can't advice, we can't deviate from that. No that's, right. gonna, that that's the circle, and everything we have to do has to be within that circle of state law and open records. And um, that can be on the website. No, it's going to be open records. These are what these def the definitions of these. This is what this means. And yeah. all of that will be communicated prior to before we even implement all of this. So exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so does council want staff to spend time now on digging into this a little bit more? I say yes. On your ten percent that you have to give us, how much how much of that ten percent will this take? It's mainly this guy. Gee. It's just a few <laughs> 
Um, when I work with the IT department, yeah, it's not. Less time than we spent talking about it. Yeah, <laughs> for real. Let's look at all the good words. And, and the forms, once Eugene figures his out, the forms stuff is easy for us to work with. The web people and all of that. that. That doesn't take a lot of time. Okay. okay. I know. We got to yeah. move. Great. Right. I'm having a break. Yeah, me too.